Lord Jesus, we love you through and through, and I pray that this morning you would hide me behind the cross and that your spirit would rain down on this place and that you'd begin to change us a little bit more from the inside out. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. A couple questions throughout our morning together. The first one is, who's been watching the World Cup? Okay, there's five of you. But now, now we're going to go down to about one. Who's watched it since America lost? Uh, oh, I'm surprised. You know, the, the drop-off rate is pretty significant after we lost uh, about a week ago. But uh, all those countries are competing, and they're all seeking a championship and the recognition that comes with it. The country that wins will be held up as heroes for at least four years. While most of us desire to be recognized, our chances of competing in a World Cup or any other worldwide championship is pretty slim to none. Yet in 1996, a man by the name of Stefan Sigmund from Romania had been trying for many years to get his name recorded in the Guinness World Book of Records. However, his attempt went up in smoke. Using a contraption that looked much like a car air filter, this man was able to smoke 800 cigarettes at one time. Only to later to discover that Guinness no longer accepted accomplishments such as these. Prior to that, though, the same man ate 29 hard-boiled eggs in just four minutes and realized afterwards that Guinness stopped recording gluttony records. And he closed out his attempts by jumping from a 135-foot cliff into water, only to realize that just previously the record was set at 176 feet. So note to self and note to Sigmund, research your bid for a Guinness World Book record before you make the attempt. People like to hear their names mentioned in a positive way. And our text for this morning is a list of people who have made some pretty amazing accomplishments. And alongside of them, there are a few who were listed who never even joined the team. And I find it interesting that the man, Nehemiah, is never mentioned in this chapter that we're going to look at this morning. My hunch is he wanted to keep the attention on his peers. And there are many attributes of Nehemiah, but this attribute of humility is woven through this chapter of chapter 3. Nehemiah is ultimately ripping a page of the Jerusalem white pages out for us this morning. The passage includes 38 names, 42 work teams amongst seven neighborhoods. And despite being a chapter that most of you probably skip when reading through Nehemiah, it is riddled with truths that we'll discover and the significance of both the name and this exceptional leader named Nehemiah. However, as I indicated, most readers skip this chapter simply because they can't pronounce the names. But it is a prime example that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, according to 2 Timothy. Call me a bit crazy, but this morning, we're going to take a little bit of time to read just a few of these names. And I'm going to ask that you would be full of compassion and grace when I attempt to do this, because I'm not going to say, read it along with me, but follow along with me. Chapter 3, Elishib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the joining section and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to him. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshalam, son of Barakah, son of Meshazebel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadak, son of Bana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to work under their supervisors. Skipping down to eight. Uziel, son of Haraha, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephiah, son of Hur, ruler of the half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jediah, son of Haramoth, made repairs opposite his house, and Hattush, son of Hashabaniah made repairs next to him. Malkajah, son of Haram, and Hashab, son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section of the Tower of Ovens. 
Shalem, son of Holahesh, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. The valley gate was repaired by Hanan and the residents of Zonah. They rebuilt it and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. They also repaired 500 yards of the wall as far as the dung gate. The dung gate was repaired by Malkajah, son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim. He rebuilt it and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. <sighs> Only halfway, but I'm going to stop at that and save you because there's limited time for our service. That happened yesterday too. I'm not sure it's ever happened for Brian, but uh, <laughs> needless to say, I'll, I'll take that and give it all to the glory of God. But seriously, I stopped because I don't think I could keep pronouncing them correctly. But I, I want to tell you that years ago, I led junior high students on mission trips, and every other year, we came back to Nehemiah to teach on his life. We inductively studied it throughout the entire week, and I remember the first time I came to chapter 3 in preparation, and I said to God, I can skip this chapter, can't I? And, and I'm telling you, this many years later, I come back to it as the pastor of family and serving, thrilled to have been able to prepare for this because there are so much great things in the lists of names that we'll discover. Remember that this is Nehemiah's private journal. One might be asking, why so many names? Well, in a year where God has been growing me in my own personal prayer life, I'm reminded that Nehemiah is writing these names down, perhaps so that he could pray for them. It's exceptionally personal for this man. Chapter three, chapter 3 is Nehemiah's private prayer journal, and these lists of peers, I believe he's pounding on heaven's door for as an interceder, by name. And God takes notes of our names. One cannot miss the strategic leadership of Nehemiah throughout this book and this chapter. I heard the axiom once said that the size of the project determines the size of the worker. And let me again provide some clarity about the project at hand or the assignment. This wall that's being rebuilt, it's 15 feet high. Most places have it about four feet wide, and it surrounds the city of Jerusalem by approximately three miles. This is not a brick retention paver that you built on your back patio deck this weekend because you had an extra day. This is even more expansive than the wall that Serve the World funds were used last year when we sent them over to Art and Dorothy Helwig to build a protection wall around their home, their ministry center, and the clinic for HIV and AIDS patients in the easternmost part of Nigeria. Nehemiah constructed teams. He built them on unity, and the bigger the project, the bigger the need for trust, which is gained slowly and lost quickly. Compare that with how Jesus prayed for her his disciples prior to his death and how he prayed for unity. John 17, 23, 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I, also, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. A little known fact about Nehemiah and his leadership and where he's located in this work project, nowhere do we discover that Nehemiah worked on a team amongst this three miles of wall. However, he worked on the entire wall. Follow along with me for a second because it's in a question. Who do you think is the most important person on a cruise ship? Answer that one. Just whisper it to your neighbor. Most people respond, the captain, right? I mean, look at how significant he is on that boat right there. That's our captain. But I would argue, not the captain, but the boat builder. You see, Nehemiah was the designer, the builder, yes, the captain, but also the foreman, the cheerleader, and later we'll discover a military strategist. We've already discovered from pastors Brian and Jeff that he was prepared, he was prayed up, and he was planned up. He is an example to follow, but his humility has him illustrating the first principle this morning in the life of others. Take the example set forth by verse 1. Leaders set the example. 
Elishib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. Verse 1. The high priests and the priests were the first ones out of the starting block. They apparently did not think that the wall was to be built by others. Rather, those with the sacred office took the lead in this restoring work. I'm confident they didn't have those construction clothing, and thus they would have worn their sacred clothes of fine linen while they picked up rubble and laid down bricks and stones. Friends, I'm reminded during this season of Growing to Serve when I walk into facilities that our leaders have been and will continue to set the pace here at FBCG. Before we went public with the generosity phase of the Growing to Serve, our staff went first. I delight in the sacrifice of being called to ministry and then set the example with our own generosity in where we serve. However, unfortunately, Elishib, the high priest, did not remain faithful. And he later partnered with the enemy, and we'll discover in, verse, in chapter 13, he created great havoc for Nehemiah. And this serves as a good example for all of us here this morning, because it's not how you begin a project, but it's how you finish that counts. Some people begin enthusiastically a job or a ministry, only to later drop out or turn against it for some reason or the other. Elishib illustrates the second point as well, though, that God uses all kinds of people. A project of this magnitude would take an entire community. It would take individuals, small groups, and a whole large group to get the job done. Look back at a few of these verses. Verse 8, Uziel, son of Haraha, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. The Lord didn't need a thousand masons or carpenters to rebuild this wall. He needed ordinary people who were willing to serve. People with a wide variety of different backgrounds and families, locations, trades, and localities gathered to work on this rebuilding project. The rulers, I'm sorry, the rulers and priests worked together with regular, ordinary people. Reflecting back onto our spring series, Growing Smaller, Pastor Brian defined work, and he said that all work is holy and anything we do in ministry is ministry if we do it unto the Lord. Whatever you're doing is necessary in the kingdom. Recently, I personally and selfishly wrestled through my own desire to make a great impact in God's kingdom. I thought to myself, God, can't you use me a little bit more significantly? And then I began preparing for this message and realized that there were people that simply picked up stones for 52 days to rebuild that which was broken. There was a place for everyone and a job for everyone to do. It's honestly the beauty of gift-based ministry. And our purpose as a church is to mobilize people for ministry. It's the emphasis on serving and why we're committed to serving the world. The vision is based on the belief that God has gifted each one of us here to be called and used and then experience a lifestyle of serving. As we use our gifts, we'll be fulfilled, we'll be fruitful, and the church will be fortified. Three years ago, First Baptist Church of Geneva, we served. Sure, we did. But then we began serving the world. And it became very front and center, I would say. Our impact outside of ourselves and outside of the walls of FBCG is healthy. And it's illustrative that our body is growing as well as our capacity. One of the key words in this chapter is the word section. It's used 13 times. And the wall was divided and people were placed at certain sections to work on it. Likewise, just as no one person could construct the whole wall by himself, so too you and I are called to work, work on certain sections in God's kingdom. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Paul reminds us in Romans 12, we have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. I'm going to pause and ask you a concluding question right in the middle of the sermon. Are you serving in your area of giftedness? 
are you serving? Because if you're not, it's time right now to use a pen around you somewhere and to write down a name of someone that you can call in the next 48 hours to find out where you can engage and begin serving because you're never going to have enough time. I mean, who has figured out how to gain more hours in a day? It can't be done. And yes, you are fabulously busy. Every single one of you is. But it's not about being busy because it's not about, being t it's not about time. It's always about priority. And God wants to make you a part of his championship team. And he needs more of you in that role. So you might have to say no to something in order to say yes to something God's calling you to. And that's why I want you to write down a name and consider calling somebody to find out where you can put yourself in the game. Vigo Olson was a doctor, also experienced an unexpected inspiration from this chapter, chapter 3. He helped rebuild 10,000 homes in war-ravished Bangladesh in 1972 as a doctor of all things. But he said about the passage that it wasn't all that moving to him until he was struck with the realization that there were no expert builders listed in the Holy Land Brigade. There were priests and priest helpers, goldsmiths and women and perfume makers, but no expert builders or carpenters, he realized. A fabulous and healthy reminder in a day when the church around the world is trying to be successful with competence and professional skills when all that is needed is everyone working in their kingdom role. Yet not everyone follows the vision and works the plan. There's arrogance in this community of Nehemiah chapter 3. Don't miss it. There's 38 names mentioned, but there's also the mention of the nobles of Tekoa in verse 5. Read this with me. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. It seems that the nobles of Tekoa refused to assist in the work. Did they think it was beneath them? Tekoa was a town 11 miles away from Jerusalem, and while some of them made the commute, the nobles of Tekoa, they phoned in sick. They refused to participate in God's work. They refused to obey orders. They were too proud to submit themselves to the supervisor's job instructions. The phrase would not put their shoulders to work suggests that pride was the significance in their lives. Nehemiah is using an agricultural term that refers to a stiff-necked ox who refuses to be yoked. A few sermon series ago, Pastor Jeff used the expression to goad. Do you remember that? Powerfully influenced my life. And so this morning, I'm going to say, I'm going to goad you just a little bit. Because anyone who refuses to roll up their sleeves and work and feels too important maybe to spend time with a hurting person or to serve in student ministries or children's ministries or to help locally or to help a hurting neighbor, well, Jeremiah 48.10 stings those of us who sit back idly. It says a curse. Jeremiah says a curse on him who is lax in doing the Lord's work. Those who are lax in the Lord's work are not only subject to a curse, they're missing out on one of the greatest privileges of all time. There is nothing, absolutely nothing better than serving in God's kingdom. And it's even more grand when you do it with your friends and with your family. And that's my final point this morning, faith at home. What do you make of those who carried out the repairs in front of their houses? What's wrong with that? Think, they would likely perform quality repairs amongst their own home if they lived right along this wall, wouldn't they? In 1948, when the Jewish sector of Jerusalem was being strangled by the Arabs, there was little time to get the women and the children to the coast because of Jerusalem being besieged. A man by the name of Dove Joseph, a Canadian lawyer, was in charge of the food rationing in Jerusalem, and he refused to evacuate. He reasoned the fighting spirit of Jerusalem's men would be raised if their homes lay helpless just behind them. Those men would have no illusions about their family's fate if the city were overrun. The pain of that decision, the awareness of the terrible moral burden that would befall on him if Jerusalem fell, weighed on him for months. But as he would remark years later, 
he said, we did not favor the easy way. Clearly evident that personal interest is a strong motivator. And the stories that each one of us could share regarding the passion for our family and what we do to protect them, to serve them, and to simply be with them, I would argue is huge. Four years ago, I served in Kenya with Justin Aarons, and I made a decision on that trip to as often as possible to take one or more family members on every trip that I did in serving. And since then, I've taken each of them somewhere. I've gone to the Dominican Republic, to Mexico and to Ecuador, even to Michigan and Wisconsin. We've immersed ourselves as a family with refugees in Aurora, and then also in a government subsidized housing unit on the east side of Aurora. And what I'm telling you is that God is changing each one of us from the inside out while we do ministry together. But back to chapter three. There are six different workers and an unknown number of priests who repaired the portions of the wall next to their homes. If all of us follow the example, our neighborhoods would look differently, I would argue. Friends, look at your neighbors as your mission field. Befriend them, serve them, pray for them. I want to challenge each of you to select two of them to commit to doing three things, to pray and care and share with them. Because as you pray for them, God will give you opportunities to serve them. And while you serve them, God will give you opportunities to tell them the good news. Notice I didn't say five to ten neighbors. I'm saying two. Because if you're successful with just one, think of the reach that First Baptist would have in, that fam in, in our community. Think of the gospel stories that we would be sharing if everyone listening this morning reached and shared the good news with just one. It would be epic. Our ministries would expand and the gospel would be shared and families and whole neighborhoods would be transformed. Friends, we're called to start at home, but we're not supposed to stay there. Verse 3, the fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. And verse 12, the daughters of Shalom worked on the wall. As families, we have the opportunities in our neighborhoods and in our community. Instead of just looking as individuals, begin to think creatively as a family of what you might do to influence the kingdom in your neighborhood. Just last week, 20 of us gathered after worship to discover where we will engage in a home called Brian's House in, in Aurora. There's four to six families from around the world that live there, and First Baptist is going to engage and figure out how to build those relationships. As a church, we're committed to impact our city, our county, our country, and our continent, and the other six continents as well. But it first begins at home. John 15, 16 says, Jesus told his disciples that he appointed them to go and bear fruit. The word appointed means he strategically placed them. The key truth that emerges in this passage is that God has placed each one of us strategically right where he wants us to be. And each one of us have been placed in a home. At this time of the year, I run the river trail every morning and the geese and their overly protective mothers are wreaking havoc on the runners, all right? But they remind me of that flight pattern that they do every fall when they fly south. And they don't fly too far south because they're always around us here in Chicago. But when I see them flying, one side of that is always a little bit longer in that V formation. Do you know why that is? Well, it's because one side has more geese than the other. But seriously, they're all flying about, a th they're thousands of miles they're flying and they're all getting there because they're working together. And there's three things I want to conclude with this morning about geese, believe it or not. Geese fly in that V formation, and that V formation reduces their effort by 71%. 71% easier to do it in a V than to do it alone. Secondly, when one falls out of the formation, two geese will follow that one down to help it and to nurture it and care for it before it's healthy enough to fly back in and fly in with another V formation. And then finally, this is the part I love about geese because I'm, I'm a honker. The geese at the rear of the formation, they're the ones honking. It's their way of announcing to the entire crew everything is going well. 
The repeated honks encourage the ones in the front to stay strong and to stay at it. And as I think about all of this, the one lesson that stands above all the others is that it's natural. It's a natural instinct for geese to work together. Whether it's flapping or helping or simply honking, the flock is in it together, which enables them to accomplish what they set out to do. This morning, I've shared a variety of challenges and opportunities with our church family. I hope that a few of you actually felt a little bit uncomfortable, but I also hope that some were inspired because I want to close with a passage from the New Testament about stones. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter reminds us we are living stones in the temple. Heaven used to be contained in the temple, in these walls of Jerusalem. But today we are living stones and we are necessary in God's kingdom. Some of us are being used for the very first time. Others are being reused. However, each stone in the master's hand has a special purpose. And this morning, know that God made you for a special purpose in God's kingdom. Amen.